so I've located myself a little bit off to the side uh, today. Uh, and part of the reason for that is I want us to kind of have this idea of, you know, at the center of all of this is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so Jesus uh, is at the center. So we've got a little bit of symbolic going on for us today with the manger in the middle. Uh, because that is how it should be for all of us, especially at this season, to remember the coming of Christ into the world is absolutely central for us. Uh, and as we continue on what we started last week uh, with the, the Gospel of Matthew, looking at uh, the first of the four Gospels, and we'll be in Matthew for quite a while. Uh, it's, a bigger, it's one of the bigger books of the New Testament. And, uh, you know, I, I made mention last week that you know, the, the disciples hung out with Jesus for about three years before he was crucified, buried, raised, and ascended. And we're going to do a, kind of the same thing. We're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew in the neighborhood of about three years, maybe even a little bit longer, depending on how this all works out. But uh, that whole time I want for us to be focusing on Christ. I want us to be focusing on the person of Jesus Christ, the work of Jesus Christ, the words of Jesus Christ, who he is. We are going to be walking with Jesus. And I, 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 you know, we should be walking with Jesus every day. That should be a central reality for us. But we're concentrating our attention now on this reality and this truth. Uh, so if you have your Bible, I would go ahead and uh, ask you to open up to the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to jump around a little bit. So we're not going to start the actual sequence of just going through it from beginning to end until next week. We're going to jump around at a couple of points. We're going to start in chapter 9 today. We're going to start in chapter 9 today. And what we're going to look at today is three uh, persons from the Old Testament that are very important throughout the Gospel of Matthew. And I, you know, you'll get to the last one, you're like, that's cheating. But you'll understand when we get there. Uh, but so we're going to talk about Jesus and three Old Testament persons today. Jesus and three Old Testament persons. And I'll tip my hand right away. And in the big idea, I'm going to tell you who they are. And that's this. Matthew presents Jesus in light of three important Old Testament persons. David, Moses, and God. David, Moses, and God. For the Gospel of Matthew, these are three figures or three people or persons that we return to again and again. Uh, David is usually pretty prominent out there when he gets mentioned because he's usually mentioned by name. Moses isn't mentioned by name quite as much, although I would say the, the kind of the allusions to or the references to Moses are way more frequent than the ones of David. And then, of course, God. Uh, and, you know, if we are talking about Jesus here, Jesus being God in human flesh, of course. Uh, but so when we talk about the Old Testament as it uh, is important to the New Testament, we talk about um, these, these important figures. And we have to understand that when we open up the New Testament, we have to understand it in light of the Old we absolutely have to understand it in light of the Old Testament. When we're, you know, next week when we start on the genealogy, which, hey, genealogy, it's like reading the Jerusalem phone book, right? It's a little bit different than that, and I'm going to tell you about how important the genealogy is when we get there next week. But what I want you to understand before we even dive into this portion is that the Old Testament, as one scholar put it, is a story in search of an ending, Okay, when you, if you were to read the Old Testament from beginning to end, what you would find is you would get to the end and you're like, well, this isn't done. This is not finished. There's, we're left hanging. It's a, the Old Testament ends with a cliffhanger, basically. And, and just a sort of a moment of anticipation and waiting. And the last words in uh, the way we have it in our English Bibles uh, are pointing to something bigger that's coming. And it's, there's this anticipation. And so the Old Testament is absolutely essential for understanding the New Testament. You don't get the New Testament without the Old. Otherwise, we'd probably just be calling it the Testament or something. And we'd be confused because there's all sorts of references to the story of the Old. But these are three super important persons 
as we look through the Gospel of Matthew. All right, so our, your first fill in the blank for today is this. Matthew presents Jesus as the son of David. Matthew presents Jesus as the son of David. So Matthew chapter 9, Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 27, and actually ending in verse 27. <laughs> There's a whole lot there. Matthew 9, 27. And as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. Have mercy on us, son of David. The name David appears 17 times in the Gospel of Matthew. You didn't know you are going to be doing any math today, did you? Yes, math is important, true, for spirituality as well. The name David appears 17 times in the Gospel of Matthew. Eight of those times, there is this phrase, Son of David, that is applied directly to Jesus Christ. Eight of those times, the name, or the, the phrase, or the title, Son of David, is applied directly to Jesus Christ. Now, why is that important? Why is that a big deal that Jesus should have to be the son of David? Well, there's a, there's a portion in the Old Testament that's uh, very kind of hinges on, or this, this you know, aspect of, the, of who Jesus is hinges on this Old Testament prophecy from the book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 7, I'm going to read part of verses 11 through 14 and then verse 16. And this is a prophecy that's given to David. So God gave this prophet Nathan a message to give it to David. And this is how it looks. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you, David, a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, that's a reference to when David dies, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now, in the initial fulfillment of this particular prophecy, what we're looking at actually is a reference to King Solomon. Okay, Solomon was the next son of David, right? At, after that point, he was the son who was going to become the follow-on king. And then after that point, Solomon has a son, and that son doesn't do quite as good of a job as either Solomon or David. And Solomon doesn't really do quite as good of a job as David. There's a little bit of a family uh, trait of sort of not doing as God would have them to do. David is good and repentant about it. Solomon, not quite as much. And then Solomon's son, even less so. And from there, the kingdom is actually split in two. It divides, it becomes a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom, and it looks like this prophecy that, that uh, Samuel records, or is recorded in, rather in 2 Samuel, it looks as though this prophecy is, is not going to come true. It, it looks as though, well, we've got a divided kingdom, this thing is falling apart, it's coming apart at the seams, there's no way this is going to work out for us. But God has made this promise. He's made this promise. The Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. He says to David, I will build your, your family. That's what house means in this passage. It's, yeah, I will build a family for you. I will, I will give you a line. And this line is going to continue. There will be more after you. It's not going to stop with you, David, but your family will continue. Now, that would have been in question possibly for David. Because there was a king before him, and that king's name was Saul, and Saul was a dreadful king. He was a terrible king, right? And David is not his son. Saul was such a bad king that God said to Saul, yeah, you're done, and none of your sons are going to become king. I'm going to start over. We're, 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 we're starting from scratch here. I'm picking 
a completely different line. And that's when David is selected and then all sorts of stuff happens. There's a giant and, you know, great stuff happens there. But so we have this moment of this prophecy and it, maybe it's David going, my line isn't finished. This isn't going to be done. I will build a house for you. When your days are full and you lay down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. Solomon, he says, he's going to have a kingdom. It's going to keep going from there. And then he doesn't stop and it kind of perpetuates. It goes past Solomon. He shall build a house. Solomon will build a house and that's a reference to the temple for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So it's not going to stop? No. So we're, we're now past Solomon because Solomon can't reign forever because Solomon's a normal, living, breathing human being. Yes, he's a, he's a regular guy. He's, he's, he's of royal blood, but those guys die too. So what's up with this? How can his kingdom continue forever? Well, for a forever kingdom, you have to have a forever king, right? Well, all the way back here at this moment in the Old Testament, we have this prophecy of this forever kingdom and forever king that will be raised up by God. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And if you are familiar with the Gospels, you'll know that at the baptism of Jesus, he goes, he, John the Baptist baptizes Jesus. He comes out of the water and it says the heavens rend open, the heavens split, and a dove descends, the Holy Spirit descends like a dove, and they hear a voice from heaven, and the voice says, this is my beloved, what? Son, on whom I am well Pleased with whom I am well pleased. And so there, the, what, what God is saying at that moment is, remember 2 Samuel 7? Here he is. Here he is. All the way back, hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus shows up on the scene, God gives this prophet Nathan a prophecy to tell to David. And he says this. And it concludes with, and he will be my son, and he shall be my son. I will be a father to him, and he shall be my son. So when you begin to see this phrase that happens occasionally throughout the Gospel of Matthew, son of David, that's the people going, and maybe not quite getting all of the implications at this point, but going, this is the one we've been waiting for. This is our king. This is the one who's going to rule over us. This is the one we've been waiting and hoping for. We have been here and we have been under foreign rule and we have been oppressed by many nations. But now finally God has given to us the king that we have been hoping and waiting for. And so when you see son of David, that's what is in mind. That's what is in mind. Now I want to go back here to the Matthew passage. As Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him crying out, not just, hey, son of David, but what do they say? Have mercy on us, son of David. Have mercy on us, son of David. Tied in with Jesus' role as king is bound up the reality and the need for mercy. We need mercy. Every last one of us is in need of mercy. Jesus didn't come simply to rule. He came to give us mercy. He came to rule mercifully. He came to be a merciful king. So when we talk about what kind of king is this? He's the king of mercy. Because the, the, the reality and, and the reason these guys are crying out for mercy is that they know that the condition of the nation of Israel as the condition of the entire human race is the condition of being needful 
of mercy. And, and here's, let, let's just kind of explain the backstory on this a little bit. So you have the nation of Israel. They've, you know, like I said, I talked about the divided kingdom, right? So the kingship didn't go well for very long. It didn't take long for the, the kind of thing to go off the rails a little bit. Well, what happens after that point is the northern kingdom is completely eventually wiped out. The northern kingdom was almost entirely ruled by terrible, terrible kings. Southern kingdom kind of had a back and forth with some really bad, some eh, could be worse. Right? But then so the northern kingdom is wiped out and then there's this southern kingdom. And the southern kingdom is this tiny little, and they're the ones that have Jerusalem. And so it, what happens is they're the last stand for the nation of Israel, the last stand for the people of God. The northern kingdom had ten of the tribes, the southern kingdom had two. There were twelve tribes of Israel, ten of them gone with the northern kingdom. The last couple of tribes, uh, they hung out in the southern kingdom until one day, come knocking at their door, was this bigger nation called Babylon. And Babylon came and knocked at the door, then kicked down the door, then took captives and then destroyed the city and destroyed the temple and they were like we're done this is this is it if you want to see a picture of the lament and despair that they experienced go read psalm 137 psalm 137 is this weeping lament by the waters of Babylon. There we, we wept and we laid down. We said we hung our harps because we, we just didn't have the heart to play. We, we wept by the rivers of Babylon. Why? Because they had been taken into captivity. Their kingdom had been destroyed. What apparently was the people of God had been completely trounced. Their nation decimated. Their city, their capital city destroyed. Their temple leveled. And it looked like the story was over. It looked like they were done and finished. And the reason that all happened was because the people lived in rebellion against God. They said, God, we don't want to do things your way. We want to do it our way. We're going to do things how we feel, how we want. We're going to worship who we want. We're going to have the kings that we want do what we want. And that's the way it's going to be. And then God said, we had an agreement we had a covenant, and in that covenant, I stipulated that if you were going to be my people, you had to obey me. You had to go my way. You had to do things the way I say they are, because I know what's best and good for you. And if you don't do those things, it's going to be, become self-destructive. And so in, at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, there is this list of blessings. If Israel followed God and did what God said to do, this is how they would be blessed. But then right after that, there's an even longer list of curses. And if the people rebelled, they were going to be cursed. And, and it concludes with, and you will go away into exile. I will send you away. You will not be my people anymore. Basically, he says, I will divorce you. You will not be my people. I have had it with you. I will send you away. And that's exactly what happened. And then hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later, Jesus shows up in fulfillment of other prophecies that talk about, but I'm going to fix this. And so we have these two blind men on the side of the road crying out, have mercy on us which is a kind of a, not just, hey, us personally, like have mercy on me so I can see, heal me so I'm not blind anymore, but it's a, our nation is in disarray, we're rebellious, we've broken, we've walked away, we've done the things that we want the way we want, under the kingship that we want, and now we don't even have that, we have rulers we don't want. This is obviously a result of our choices. Have mercy on us, which is their way of saying, fix this, we can't fix this. You're our king. We need you. And the truth is, all of us are that way. Because human beings are a rebellious people. By birth, by nature, we rebel. Because that's what we have inherited from our first father, Adam. 
We have inherited a nature of brokenness and sin and bent away from Godness. And so along with these guys, these two blind guys who have nothing, they're sitting there, they're begging. That's a great description of the human condition. Blind beggars who can't do anything for themselves when it comes to God. Crying out the only thing we can cry out. Have mercy on us, our king. Lift us up out of this brokenness. So when Jesus came, he didn't come to be a king merely in the sense of, hey, there's this guy who rules this nation. He came to be a king who was to bring mercy on his rebellious people. He came to be a king who would lift us up out of our brokenness, our sin, and our death, and raise us to life. Have mercy on us, son of David. The Davidic theme is about Jesus as the Messiah King. In other words, he is not just my personal Savior. He is that. But he is my merciful king. He is our merciful king. And that's the David angle on all of this. Point number two, Matthew presents Jesus as the new Moses. Matthew presents Jesus as the new Moses. You know Moses, right? Old Testament guy, tablets, mountainside, Ten Commandments, a lot more than that. But Jesus is the new Moses. There's this fascinating uh, prophecy uh, in the book of Deuteronomy that, that God is talking with Moses and he says, you know, you, you're not going to last forever, but I'm going to, I, one day there will be a prophet like you. I will bring a prophet like you who will deliver the people. And that is who Jesus is. He's not only the Davidic line king, he's also this new Moses. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 2. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. This is the beginning of what you might know as the Sermon on the Mount. Right? Jesus goes up on a mountain and begins teaching people. Now, if you're paying attention and you know your Old Testament, there are ringings of Moses in these two verses. This is about Jesus being the new Moses. So how does that work? Well, let's go look at Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. They set out from Rephidim and came to the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain while Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. And so God has Moses come up the mountain, and then he gives them his message, and then he sends Moses down to, to speak from the mountain and speak to the people and tell them, look, I've just delivered you, and here's this law that I intend for you to obey. And then a few hundred years later, because what, what we'll find out in the New Testament, by the way, is that the law that Moses received and gave to people, it's a good law, but there was a problem. They were bad people. <laughs> and bad people can't follow a good law. And no matter how good the law was and how good and from God it was, the people who had their hearts essentially still far from God couldn't follow God's ways. God has a perfect standard and a perfect law that he gave to a very imperfect people, and they couldn't fulfill it. And so 
exile, sent away, Babylon, Persia, lots of these other nations in this line, this successive, successive line of bigger nations that have defeated Israel and are keeping Israel under oppression until you get to Rome. Jesus shows up under the Roman Empire. Jesus shows up under another oppressive empire, and he does the Moses thing. He does the Moses thing, doesn't he? Seeing the crowds, what does he do? He goes up on a mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them, just like Moses did. Now, this is just one sliver of the parallels between Jesus and Moses. There are lots of others. Uh, so when Moses was a baby, for example, there was a Pharaoh who didn't know Joseph, it said. And so, interesting that Joseph is the name of a person in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. There's a purpose for that. But there is a Pharaoh who rose who didn't know Joseph, who was a good guy from Israel, helped the people, helped Egypt. He says, I don't know, these, I don't know this Moses guy, but there are all these Israelites around and I'm a little worried that they're going to take over. So he begins to oppress them. And one of the ways that this Pharaoh oppresses the Israelite people is that he says, all right, all of the firstborn sons, we're going to kill them. We're going to kill them. And so that, they put this plan into motion. But there was this one Jewish mother who hid the baby, a little baby named Moses, hid him, put him in the little kind of basket, hit him in the rushes. Pharaoh's daughter finds him and says, oh, cute baby, I think I'll adopt this one. I'll bring it into my house. Right? You know that whole story. So, but then fast forward to Jesus. There's another king. Not an Egyptian king, but this is actually the, the Israelite king, though he's not Jewish. His name is Herod. And he says, well, there's this prophecy of this new king that's supposed to be born. Better kill the babies. Just like Pharaoh did. And, and as we go through, and I'll point several of these out as we go through the, the Gospel of Matthew, there are all of these parallels between Jesus and Moses pointing us to Moses was a prefigure or a forerunner of this Jesus that we meet in the New Testament. Jesus is the new Moses. He went up on a mountain and he taught them. This parallels Moses giving the old covenant to Israel. So Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, is essentially giving a new law. And you will hear Jesus say things like, Well, you have heard it said, but I tell you. And what Jesus is doing there is he's responding to common interpretations of the Jewish law that have gotten way of course. And he's saying, nope, you've heard it said, but I tell you. And he gives them a completely different way of life, a completely different. And it's different from the Moses law because the Moses law was here are all of these regulations, here are all of these things, you follow, do these sacrifices this way, follow this, do this, slit this throat that way, do all the, you know, it's kind of like, ah, what is all of this? And then Jesus shows up and he says, all right, we're not doing that. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to have to, we're going to, have to start with your heart. I have to, if, if you're going to follow God, I have to change your heart. And that's what the, what the Sermon on the Mount is ultimately pointing to. This new law that is given through Jesus is a law of love. And that's actually a phrase that we find at other points in the New Testament, the law of love. It's a different kind of law. But Jesus comes and he's not only the new Moses, but as Hebrews would essentially tell us, he's the better Moses. He's more Moses-y than Moses was. And what did Moses do apart from giving the law? He was the deliverer. He was the one whom God raised up to stand up to the face of Pharaoh and say, You let my people go. And Jesus is one who stands up to all of the powers of darkness, to all of the power of sin, stands up to the face of the devil, and he says, you let my people go. These are mine, and I'm taking them back. 
you can't have them anymore. You don't get to keep them. I will take them from you. I have come to take what is mine, and you will not stop me. Do your worst. And I actually think what happened was Jesus tricked them into doing their worst to him. Because in so doing, in him going to the cross and allowing them to do their worst to him, he absorbed and exhausted the power of it. That's what uh, Paul tells us in Colossians. He triumphed over them by the cross. He says he disarmed the rulers and authorities. And that's all of the human rulers and authorities, but it's also the spiritual rulers and authorities that he talks about in Ephesians chapter 6 who are in heavenly realms that are opposed to God. It says he won over them too. He, he completely defeated them. Jesus has already won. And Jesus is the deliverer that Moses could only have ever hoped to be. That Moses was kind of the, you know, he's the prefigure, he's the forerunner, he's the, he's the shadow, he's the type. Christ is the reality. Christ is the reality. The Mosaic theme, the Moses theme, is about how Jesus has both deliverer and initiator of a new covenant, of a new kind of law. In Jesus, I'm delivered from sin and shame and delivered to the purifying, strengthening presence of God. That's the kind of Moses that Jesus is. He's one who delivers not just people from a location, but he delivers us from a condition. Jesus doesn't deliver us from a location. He delivers us from a condition, a condition of brokenness, a condition of pain, a condition of sorrow, a condition of sin. One day, he will deliver us finally and fully from these things. But for now, if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you've been delivered from an eternity apart from Christ. You have been delivered from sin and death in the biggest way, in the biggest way. Number three, Matthew presents Jesus as God with us. Matthew presents Jesus as God with us. Matthew 1.23, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And Matthew here is quoting Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7. Once again, hundreds of years before Jesus shows up on the scene is this prophecy of, do, of Jesus doing precisely what he says he's going to do. He's going to deliver his people. But behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they will call him God with us. God with us. Even today, we often function under a misconception of God as distant, of God as on a faraway cloud. Don't all of those far side cartoons show us that? Don't all of those images that we see in television and read about in books paint for us a picture of God as far away, as, as, as God of as distant? He's not. He never has been distant from us. He's always been around. But in Jesus, we find something special. In Jesus, we find something special. Not just God positionally, locationally close to us, because you can't escape God. Read Psalm 139. He is the inescapable God. There is no place where God is not. But in Jesus, he's with us in a different way. He's with us in a different way. How is he, how is it? How is that, how, how could it be different? Because before, we were divorced from him. We were separated from God. Even though he's close to us, we had no relationship with him that was good. 
We had no positive, no life-giving, no affirming relationship with our God because we had brokenness and sin. We had rebellious hearts that would turn us away from God. It's different now because Jesus came. And, and it, you know, you've got the picture of Jesus. He's God in human flesh, right? God walking around in person. And he's with them in that way. And that's kind of part of what, the, the, um, what that is all about. Jesus walking amongst God's people. John chapter 1 talks quite a bit about that. He pitched his tent among us, right? He, took, he, the, he put flesh on and walked around with us. But there's an even deeper and closer sense in which now God is with those who believe. With those who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and have received eternal life from him. God is with us relationally. He is now not just ruling God, not just creator God. He is now, as he tells us in the Gospel of John, friend God. He's our friend. He's with us because he loves us. Do you, do you a show of hands, anybody in this room love somebody? Don't be afraid now, especially if those of you who are sitting next to your spouses, okay? Right? Don't be shy. Yes. Do you mind if you don't see them for like, I don't know, years at a time? Yeah, that's weird, isn't it? Like, oh, I love that person. How are they doing? I don't know. I haven't talked to them in a few years. N no. That's not how love works. When you love someone, you want to be with them. You want to be close to them. Well, that's how God is with you. That's what the incarnation of Jesus, Jesus taking on flesh, that's what Jesus going to the cross, that's what Jesus rising from the tomb, that's what Jesus ascending to heaven is all about. It's all about the God who loves us and wants to be with us. It's all about the God who is nuts about you. It's all about the God who says there's comfort and security and peace in heaven. I'm going to set that aside and I'm going to go and live where it hurts. I'm going to go and live where I bleed I'm going to go and live where there is heartbreak. I'm going there where to live where there's sometimes cruddy weather. I'm going to go because that's where my people are. And they can't be my people unless I go and be with them. They can't be my people unless I go and rescue them. They can't be my people unless I go and show them how much I love them and invite them to a relationship with me. And that's what God with us means. That's what God with us is about. So that's the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew. At the end of the Gospel of Matthew, there's Matthew 28, 20. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So Jesus, this is him right before he ascends. This is him right before he takes the throne in heaven. But him going to the throne doesn't mean he is any less with us. Doesn't mean he is any less showing us how much he loves us. He's still with us. H have you ever, you know, those of you who raised your hand that said you love somebody, right? Can you endure an apartness for a brief time? Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 they're in another room. Oh, no. Do they still love me? Of course they still love you. Okay, it may start out that way. Start out very insecure in those relationships. And, and some of us are that way with God. Does he still love me? It doesn't feel like it. Maybe, it. maybe it's been a while. No. Be assured. I am with you 
always. I am with you always. I am with you. How often, God, are you with me? When I feel like it? When things are going well? When my bank account is doing okay? When I'm not behind on my payments? Are you, are you with me then? When I stumble? When I fail? Are you still with me? When I mess up? Are you with me then? Yeah. Still with you. I have not left you. Because he won't. He won't. He doesn't want to. You don't get to push him away. Sometimes we try. Sometimes we go, all right, well, I just kind of want to do things my way. He's still with you. Still with you. Still present. Still in love with you. You still matter to him. You still matter to him. So when we talk about Jesus as God, it's not some distant clinical theological concept. Oh, yes, well, I know that he's the third person of the Trinity, is this, that, and the other. The hypostatic union is... No, 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 set that aside for a minute. Set that aside. Yes, he is God. Yes, he is God in human flesh. But that doesn't begin to cover God with us. Because God with us is, I'm close to you. I'm close to you. When you feel a big loss, I'm close to you. When you trip, I'm close to you. When things aren't going your way, I'm close to you. When things are going really, really well, I'm close to you. His presence with us is not in any way conditional on how your day is going. He's with you. He is with you. And he's with me. Believe it or not. Here's some questions to chew on. Number one, do I bow to Jesus as my merciful king? Do I bow to Jesus as my merciful king? He's my better David. Do I remember him as my king? Do I trust him as my king? Do I let him lead me and rule me as my king? Number two, do I live as one delivered by Jesus from a great bondage? Your situation has been changed massively by Christ. Do you live like it has? Do you believe this? Are you living in light of this? Number three, do I live conscious of the presence of God who wants to be with us? Do I live conscious and, and, and understanding of, yeah, he's, he's with me. Now, because I want you to kind of get this one last kind of thing on God with us. I want you to take note that it doesn't say God with me. It says God with us. It's not just with you and nobody else. There is that dynamic. There is that relationship by implication of the fact that God is with us. We are one. We are one body. The entire church, not just this one church, but every true church on the face of the planet, past, present, and future, he has gathered us together as his people, and he is with all of us. And yes, he has a personal relationship with you, but he also has a personal relationship with the person sitting next to you. Do you live conscious, conscious of the presence of Jesus, the presence of God who wants to be with us? Not just you, but us. Because you don't get to do this thing by yourself. The, the Christian life is not lived alone. It's not lived by yourself. It's lived in community with the rest of the people of God. It's lived in community with the rest of the people of God. Do I 
live conscious of the presence of God who wants to be with us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We praise your name for you have sent to us a king. You have sent to us a deliverer. But by doing so, you actually have come to us yourself. You have come to us, God in human flesh, with us. And you've made it so that we can be with you. We thank you, God, for the truth of this. We, we pray that it would, it would permeate our persons, the, the entirety of the fabric of who we are. We want to be changed by the truth of God with us, of God delivering us, of you, God, our King, ruling over us as a merciful, benevolent King. We thank you, God, for all of these truths of who Jesus is. And as we celebrate Christmas this season, help us to be mindful of understanding and believing and trusting and leaning on all of these truths, especially that you are with us. We pray all of these things in your name. Amen.